Happy Easter to everyone from Nicaragua. I'm Scott Al Miller. This is my vlog of daily life living here in Central America, and it is an incredibly bright and sunny Easter Sunday, and I'm actually recording this on the morning of Easter Sunday, so I'm standing up. This is what it looks like here for Easter in Central America, and today we're going to be hitting a couple of topics. I am kind of scrambling to get the show done. Obviously, if I'm recording it on the same day that you're going to see it, it's I'm rushing, right? But we're going to be talking about where across Central America, not just in Nicaragua, do we find the most pleasant, that is the coolest climate, cities and places to live. So we're going to touch on that. We're going to touch on a little bit about what kind of uh, stuff we need to put in our luggage when coming to Nicaragua, because that is something that people do need to worry about. And we're going to talk a little bit about how you manage keeping the prices low or not getting gringo priced when we're dealing with buying property here in Nicaragua, but it would apply to other parts of the region as well. So we're going to get to those three things right after the bump. Regular viewers know that I've been scrambling to get the show done for some time. I've just been very busy. Everything's good. It's just I'm, I'm often doing it kind of at the last minute rather than having a number of shows built up over time so that I can stay on top of things and, and have Valentina doing the, the thumbnails ahead and just everything. So I'm now starting this week. I think I'm at a point where I'm going to be doing some catch up and I'm hoping that I'll be doing a bit of that today. But today's episode, I'm actually recording at the time and the sun is crazy harsh. But I wanted to be out in the sunlight, so I apologize that I'm kind of in the shadow of my hat uh, and everything's so bright, but it's just, it's a nice day. All right, so uh, we got a couple questions that came in, and each of these is not too big on its own, so I'm going to put some of these together. I'm going to bring them up and read them. So I, I don't have who asked these, but I think this was... Uh, 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 Dovey Good Guy. Uh, Scott, regardless of the country in Central America, from Guatemala to Panama, which major cities in that region do you feel have the most pleasant and comfortable climate comparable elsewhere to uh, Carretero or Cuenca? Okay, so uh, obviously here in Central America, we have a tendency towards very hot temperatures and this is a great example of it. Leon and Chinandega are two of the hottest cities across Central America, along with Panama City. So to answer his question, those three are just right out. Like we're as far from what he's looking for as possible from a weather perspective. At least these are cities that are consistently extremely hot. There's never a break from the hot temperatures. Here, it's bright sun almost all year round. We are at sea level and we're in an area that just holds the heat. So it's a combination of things that make these the hottest areas. Really simply, starting off, if you're looking for the most pleasant temperatures, both Panama and Nicaragua, not just their main cities, but across the countries can be ruled out. These are your hottest countries. Yes, Panama has a few places to get a little bit more pleasant. Yes, Nicaragua has Esteli and Matagalpa and Hinotega, but you're not going to find those to qualify in the most pleasant category, no matter what you do. If you're looking for the most pleasant within Nicaragua, they're your choices, and they're pretty nice. But the region has some really nice nice cities with great weather and unfortunately Panama and Nicaragua just can't compete on that one particular point. So let's talk about which cities really do have that amazing weather. Starting from the south, Costa Rica is actually interesting because it has decent weather while sandwiched between Nicaragua and Panama, both of which are super hot. Now, don't get, don't get me wrong, there are parts of Costa Rica that are going to be just or nearly as hot as Panama and Nicaragua. The coastal regions where you're at sea level they are very warm. If you go from Nicaragua to Costa Rica directly, you basically don't notice any change at all. It's one continuous area. And much of northwestern Costa Rica, which is a lot of the important coastline that people think of as, as traditional Costa Rican uh, living and retirement and, and option zones for people. Uh, I have quite a bit of wind today and the plants are blowing into the camera. Uh, that area is known as the Nicoya Peninsula or the Nicoya region. And Nicoya literally means Nicaraguan. So in, in the Costa Rican uh, slang. So that region is so much like Nicaragua that at one point it may have been Nicaragua. This is kind of disputed, but Costa Ricans refer to it as the Nicaraguan zone. It would be kind of like if part of the northern U.S. was known as Little Canada, right? Maybe maybe the north half of Maine was known as Little Canada or the, the Canadian Peninsula or something like that. You can see how that would make sense. So that's kind of how that is. They consider that to be their own little piece of Nicaragua there in Costa Rica. So 
it, you do get really hot there. But the main city in Costa Rica, San Jose, is up in the mountains. And it's a big city, so if you're looking for an urban environment, it's good for that. But it also has really good weather. It's not the best in the region, but it's quite good and better than anything you're going to find in Panama or Nicaragua. So uh, from a big city perspective, it's bigger than either of those countries offer. And from a weather climatic perspective, it really does get pretty pleasant. It, you will get hot days there. Right, you're not going to be 100% avoiding hot weather. It is still Costa Rica, but you are high enough in the mountains that you get that kind of up in the air, highlands kind of vibe. Uh, and you will get rainy days and cloudy days and, and nice breezes and just generally pleasant weather. There is a reason why throughout three countries, this one in, in an area that is generally not that heavily populated, has has gained so high of a population, well over 2 million in its metro area. It, it's, it's the climate primarily. It is a really beautiful area to live in. So if you're looking for very, very pleasant, but with a warm hint, San Jose is a really great option for a large urban environment. So it's very hard uh, to beat and, and definitely unbeatable in the southern half of Central America. Now to look even more pleasant, we have to go to the northern half to the triangle, the northern triangle, of Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador. So let's talk about those. When we head into the northern countries, you may think that Tegucigalpa, the large capital of Honduras, might be a great, very mild temperature location because of its high mountain location. And it's not terrible, but the reality is, is that Tegucigalpa is more or less similar to Esteli and Matagalpa. It's mild, but it's not really leading the region in mild. If you're looking for that warmer mild like you get here in the Nicaraguan highlands, Tegucigalpa may beat those, but it's really, really close. Surprisingly, up north in Honduras, the second city, San Pedro Sula, is actually the more mild of the two. It's still not the best in all of Central America, but it is the best you're going to find for a very large area. It's roughly equivalent to San Jose, Costa Rica. So that's one that I think surprises a lot of people, but a lot of people are pretty wary of looking at San Pedro Sula at this time. It has traditionally, meaning over the last 15 to 20 years, been the most dangerous city in all of Central America and often in the world. This is homicide and violent crime leading location. So that makes people a little bit less likely to just move there just because the climate's nice. However, in the last couple of years, Honduras has really cracked down on crime and danger there in uh, San Pedro Sula and across the country. And San Pedro Sula has moved. It is still more dangerous than Tegucigalpa, but it is now safer than US locations like Cleveland or Milwaukee. Uh, so. That doesn't make it a super safe city, but it does put it in line with what Americans are used to. So it's often good enough these days, but that is a new thing. And there's a lot of things. People are not confident that that is true. People are w worried that that's going to uh, change in the future and that it's not going to last in the way that it is, which would be very unfortunate if you move there. So a lot of people aren't really moving in, but the city is seeing a kind of mini renaissance right now. Uh, new businesses are going in, people are going out, restaurants are flourishing because people have been scared to go out for so long. Suddenly there's an opportunity to do so and it's a relatively modern city. I have not been there, just I just want to preface this. I've done a lot of research on it. I am planning, I hope, soon to do a trip there. And one of the things I really like about San Pedro Sula, anyone would like, who's an American, is that flights from San Pedro Sula up to the United States can be as low as $38 that I've seen just looking casually in the last couple of weeks. Uh, and they go directly to Houston. So if you have any reason to be connecting through Bush Intercontinental in the north side of Houston, super cheap and super convenient that's a big deal uh, now that San Pedro Sula is in line with Houston for safety, still more dangerous, but not, not wildly different. It could be a location where being able to go back and forth between those locations would be would be outrageously uh, convenient and may trump a lot of other things that you may be looking at. So it, it's a cool city. I think it's got a lot of potential. I'm really excited about going up there and filming at some point, uh, but it looks like I'm not going to be flying through there just because we're also getting flights out of Managua to all the way to Houston for like $65, which, yeah, that's a lot more when you're looking at just the price of the tickets when you consider I can just catch a ride in our car over to Managua and I don't have to take a bus 
up to San Pedro Sula, and one is an hour and a half away, and one is nine hours away, right? If you're living here now, it's worth paying the extra 30 bucks to fly out of Managua. But if you if you are looking at a permanent location and you're trying to pick a place, that, that could be a factor. Or if you're not going to Houston or have no need to go to the U.S., then that would be completely wasted. But it does have a major airport, both San Pedro Sula and Tegucigalpa, and of course San Jose, have much more uh, uh, busy, much more routes and stuff in their airports than anything here in Nicaragua. Now, if we hop over to uh, uh, El Salvador, the city there is San Salvador, and it is decently mild, but it's very much in line with Tegucigalpa, so it, you're not going to get anything outrageously mild. It is completely livable. Like, don't get me wrong. It is good temperatures. You're really not getting into the mids and high 30s. You're normally in the low 30s, and anything that's in the low 30s, this is all Celsius, uh, is a good place to live, right? You're, you're not you're not terrible, but you can't call it the most mild. Uh, but it, but it is decent, right? All of those, the Nicaraguan Highland cities, Tegucigalpa, uh, 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 and El Salvador, all or San Salvador, all of those are going to be options for nearly everyone. But if you want to get just that little bit cooler, going north into Guatemala is where you go. Guatemala just takes all of Central America and makes it a bit more mild, and that is why. Guatemala is traditionally the population heartland of the region. It is far cooler up there than it is down in any of the countries south of it, all the way, and not until Colombia do you start getting to those same temperatures again uh, because of the, uh, it's a little bit farther north, but it is a lot higher in elevation for the majority of the population. Of course, again, if you're on the coast at sea level, it's going to be almost identical to the rest of Central America. It's, it, the variation is incredibly small, but when you go up to its main cities, its main city is Guatemala City, which is the largest city in Central America, and its secondary city, Quetzaltenango, or Shela is uh, a good sized city on its own, um, but definitely not in the same category as Guatemala City, Panama City, Tegucigalpa, cities like that, but it is a, a fair sized city. Uh, and if you watch Scott Moore's channel, they are living up there currently uh, in Shela and they, they love it a lot. Um, so, so Guatemala City is uh, very much in line with San Pedro Sula, the, the very mild cities, uh, but still feel warm, but they're, they're very, very mild. Uh, so those can be just great options, and I think a lot of people will choose them, but both of them have kind of rough reputations. San Pedro Sula for danger, and Guatemala City, for some reason, has a reputation for being just uninviting or boring, which I think is crazy, because to me, it is my absolute, no question, far and away favorite city in the region, one of my favorite in the world, maybe my favorite city in the world. Uh, so Guatemala City, I think, is is really vibrant. It has a great food scene. It has a great nightlife scene. It has lots of interesting neighborhoods, interesting architectures, great parks, uh, big airport, easy access to things, beautiful mountain scenery, easy-ish to get to great areas like uh, Lago de Atatlan and to uh, um, Habitanango, right? Cool stuff up in the mountains. It's got volcanoes. It's got uh, the the old colonial city of Antigua, not very far away, except for when there's mudslides, then it's like forever away. But it, it's a great everything. Like it has very little negative to say about it. And yet people just don't find it interesting. I can't figure out why. And my videos that I did there, everybody, one, they got lots of views. And two, everybody's like, this is a beautiful city. Holy cow. We had no idea. And like, seriously, no one knows what a great city it is. But like nearly 6 million people live in this beautiful metropolis in the middle of Central America uh, with really great weather. But if you want the absolute best weather, and that's coming from a North American perspective, of course, if you grow up in Central America, it's actually too cold, uh, is Quetzaltenango. Up in northern uh, Guatemala, the, the secondary city, Quetzaltenango or Shela, has dual names, one in Spanish, one in Nahuatl. I believe that. Actually, I think they're both Nahuatl. I don't really know. <laughs> yeah, they're so much cooler that they actually start to verge on being a chilly city. They're a bit farther north, actually quite a bit, several hours drive farther north than Guatemala City, and they're at higher altitude. Now, none of these cities in Central America are at such a high altitude that any normal person would be worried about like altitude sickness or anything like that. You don't really run into that so much until you get to like Mexico City. And lots of people don't get alt altitude sickness in Mexico City. You couldn't have a city that big uh, if, if they did in such a central like hub for, for transportation. But when we go through Mexico City, for example, I always notice the lack of air and my wife does start to get sick. So if you're sensitive to altitude, Mexico City is on the high side, but that is why Mexico City remains so cool. Also, it's much farther north. 
the highlands in Guatemala are not that dramatic, but they are dramatic enough to give you much cooler and more mild weather. So if you're looking for, you just don't want to sweat. You want to be able to wear a jacket. You want to be able to just go outside, go for a walk, walk hard, not get sweaty, not worry at all about getting warm, which a lot of people looking at Central America would actually be like, that's not actually what I want. A lot of us actually want warmer than that. But if you want that slightly edging towards Ireland, Scotland, and England kind of weather, then that even farther north in Guatemala is going to do that. So Quetzaltenango may be that magic answer for all of you who are like, I just can't contemplate hitting the 30s on a regular basis. Even if it's the really like 29, 30, 31 degrees, if that's like, mm, I don't, I don't want to do that, I'd have to run air conditioning all the time, then Quetzaltenango could easily be, from a city perspective, the place you want to go. There's, in all these countries, not Nicaragua or Panama, but in most of the other countries, there are at least villages that you could get into, you know, really limited locations that have colder weather, and even El Salvador, which you'll notice the big city wasn't that cool, but they do have locations that get snow. But there's no major population there, so uh, it depends what you're looking for. But from a city perspective, the clear, far and away winner is Quetzaltenango in northern Guatemala. If you're willing to be a little bit more broad-minded and, and edge outside of Central America proper, the region that is uh, geographically and culturally Central America, but not geopolitically, is in southern Chiapas in Mexico. That region, which of course is more expensive because you're in the Mexican peso, which is really strong right now, and Mexico in general is more expensive than Central America, but it is still an affordable location, just a little bit more than here. And you get a lot of different vibe because you're politically inside Mexico instead of politically inside the, the CA4. So maybe this rules it out for you, but if you're just looking at the general region and thinking Central America is about right, that very southern bit of, of Mexico is an area known as Los Altos. Traditionally, meaning 200 years ago, Los Altos was a separate country that sat between Mexico and Guatemala. Quetzaltenango was its capital. So part of it sits today inside Guatemala, but part of it today sits inside Mexico. And that region that's inside Mexico also has some cities and some mild climates and some mild regions that you may want to consider. If the, the reason you want to be down here is Central American culture, it does spill over into Mexico. If it's Central American weather, that spills over into Mexico. But if you want that designation of the CA4, obviously that does not spill over. Uh, but for some people, you may like all the things about Central America, but not want whatever features or requirements come with the CA4. You may like the Mexican requirements. You actually get a choice in this region where you can opt to live with Central American food and culture and weather and all that stuff, but be inside Mexico. Uh, it's, it's a relatively limited region, but it's not super tiny. You definitely can consider living there and it's super affordable and, and very nice and, and has that history with this region just chose to annex itself uh, up to the north um, for, for different opportunities. Uh, so that is something you could consider for sure as well for a lot of people. It's, uh, it's nice having those kinds of options and it's not completely unlike the Basque region in uh, where it comes between France and Spain, that you can be in this cultural region of the Basque land, but you can choose to live in the south and be within the Spanish political zone and be under Spanish laws and requirements and cost of living and monetary system, or you can opt to be in France and have their laws and monetary. Now, they both use the euro today, but the, the Basque country is just split right down the middle. Los Altos is a little bit more in Guatemala than in Mexico, but it's the same basic thing. So uh, that former country of Los Altos has disappeared in most senses, having been split and absorbed into each neighboring country. And its identity isn't that strong. So it isn't like you go into it and you're like, we're in Los Altos. And you're like really a pair of it, but uh, uh, aware of it. But its name gives away why its weather is so nice. Its name is Los Altos, the Heights. It was a country in this region that was so elevated because of the mountains that they just named themselves the Heights for their entire country. So that gives away why Quetzaltenango is the chilliest and most mild of all the cities here in Central America. A question just came in or a comment just came in from Truth Seeking Always while I was making this video. So I'm going to go ahead and read it and, and answer his, his uh, uh, question here. He says, great to know. Thanks. This is in reference to how do you get taxis and in, in using InDriver here in Nicaragua. My family's first trip outside the U.S. starts August 31st and we are staying six weeks in Nicaragua, all thanks to your videos. That's 
freaking awesome. Uh, I've booked four weeks of our stay so far on Airbnb, and now seeing this video, it makes me wonder, is there a Nicaraguan version of Airbnb I should be using? And that's actually a really good question. That would make a lot of sense, and the answer is no, but it's a logical question to have asked because we do have our own answer to Uber and things like that, and we do have our own answer to Uber Eats, right? So uh, InDriver, if you're going to use a taxi, uh, and, and uh, Pedidos Ja, uh, if you're going to uh, order food or, or home delivery of groceries or, or pharmaceuticals, anything like that, unless uh, some places like Pharma Value have their own delivery. But besides that, as a general service, Pedidos Ja is what you use for basically everything. Um, and, and it works across the region, but it is Nicaraguan. It is from Managua. They're headquartered there, and they beat out the competition and completely eliminated them here in the region. So when I first moved here, and for the first couple of years, we were using multiple services, and it was actually the one we used less, uh, but it won across the region and is now the only player other than places using their own delivery. So InDriver and Petito's Jaw, they're the only games in town for those things. But for apartments, Airbnb still rules here. I don't know if that will last. I think it's a great idea to have a Nicaraguan alternative to that. You could have something with uh, more, more information about the local environment and all that, but we don't have that currently. Someone would have to go build a pretty extensive uh, technology platform to do that. But Pedidos Jaw did, so that's plausible. The difference is, is that Pedidos Jaw uh, works across the region um, and, and Nicaraguans and Costa Ricans and, and Guatemalans, whatever, do a ton of, of having things delivered at home uh, and people take taxis all the time, but the locals do not use apps for renting apartments. They normally stay with friends, stay with family, or stay in hostels when traveling. So it's relatively rare that they would be looking for high-end hotels, that happens, uh, and almost never do they look at Airbnb. Um, there are some people who rent houses that are not on Airbnb. I think it's mostly word of mouth. Um, I know Encuentra 24 does do that, but I don't think it works very well. Facebook, Facebook Marketplace, people do use those tools for things, but there isn't a centralized thing. Maybe there should be. It's a, it's a really good uh, question and not something that I've thought about previously. I would not be completely surprised to see it spring up and be a useful tool, but at the moment, no such thing exists and no one has talked about one, but it's a good question. So that's awesome that you're coming. Your first trip outside to the, U the U.S. to Nicaragua. That is a very exotic location for a first trip, but it is a very safe, welcoming country. Um, <laughs> that is, I do generally recommend places like Canada and Mexico and the U.K. as like a, an intro to international travel. Nicaragua is a little bit less holding your hand. It's very friendly, very safe. Like it's great as a first time traveler. And Kami, who's been on the show, this was the first country she ever came to. She was 20. Many just turned 20 years old. No one in her family had ever traveled internationally. I think she's not including the U.S. because she grew up right on the border. I think she crossed into the U.S. now and then. But the U.S., northern U.S. and southern Canada, you can't tell, right? Miles, kilometers, other than that, it's all one thing. Um, but she had never been anywhere internationally, didn't know anyone who had been, and just hopped a flight to Nicaragua. Uh, and that's how we, we met her. Um, so, so it can be done and people do it. And Nicaragua does have a lot of just throwing you into the deep end, but with some safety, uh, safety nets that there really are. It's not that big of a country. It's not, there's just ways to get things done. Um, but six weeks, that's really cool. Uh, let us know more about where you're staying, what you're doing, when you're going to get here and all that, but really interesting. All right, this is a quick one. Question for Luke asks for question for future review. Short list of easy items to bring in luggage that is difficult or expensive to import, like GoPro batteries or bitters for cocktails, like I said in last year's episode. So this is a tough one because it's really going to depend on what you use. Now, first of all, we can get bitters here. I don't know if it's worth importing bitters like in your luggage, like one bottle for your house, like sure, but is it worth the effort? You're only going to spend one to two dollars more here. And how long is it going to last you? I understand that if that's the bottle is only five dollars, one to two dollars more is like a huge percentage, but the effort of bringing it is probably not worth one to two dollars. So things like that you probably don't care about. The big deals about getting stuff here in Nicaragua are normally things that are electronics, things that come out pretty quickly, uh, things you can't get replacements for, like like bitters. You could be like, well, I really want Fee Brothers bitters from Rochester, New York. Hey, I'm from Rochester. I get it. They make great bitters. But here you're going to have to live with Angostura bitters. In reality, Angostura is really awesome bitters too. Most people consider it better. They're wrong, of course, but they consider that. So if you just substitute Angostura for Fee Brothers and spend an extra dollar or two, you don't have to worry about it with cocktails. If you're looking at big bottles of alcohol, bringing that stuff in luggage is really not an option. You can get some stuff in Duty Free, it's gonna be very limited. But yeah, if there's some alcohol that you really want, you can get from Duty Free and, and we don't have it here and you're not gonna go through it so fast that you need to find a supply here. 
great, that, that could make sense. That kind of stuff does exist, very limited. The things that really matter, yeah, GoPro batteries, anything like that, batteries, electronics, cameras, camera parts, microphones, anything that's really specific and typically digital uh, is going to be something you need. Anything that's a specialty part that you would be like, well, I just can't go to Walmart and get it. Anything you can't go to a normal store. If you have to do special orders in the US, assume you'll have to do special orders here in Nicaragua, but we don't have Amazon, we don't have Newegg, we don't have all that stuff. You can go through Alibaba, you can go through AliExpress, you can do those things and have it shipped from China. That, that's a lot more work, and a lot more cost because it's not already in the country. Um, um, so, so those things are, you can kind of foresee what they are. The exception would be cell phones, unless you're on Apple. If you're on Apple, you want to get that in the US. If you're on Android, you want to get that here in Nicaragua, because that's what everybody uses here. There's no Apple stores, but there's tons of Android from really good vendors like Xiaomi and Huawei and, and Honor and those, those companies, you can get really high end phones at pretty good prices here in the country. And then you're able to get service on them and everything so for cell phones i generally recommend getting them here except i'm on apple a lot of people know like look i've got apple laptops apple desktops apple phones my kids have ipads i'm not actually that big of an apple fan but their ecosystem makes sense for us and the way we live and the work that i do in editing these videos and that stuff so we're we're just kind of making that commitment and as a traveler i'm a really big proponent of apple phones for travel they have we, every single time that we've tried to travel with Android, we ended up in a dangerous situation because of some combination of the, the actual Android hardware or firmware on it not giving us the flexibility or reliability to do what we needed to do safely, uh, or the vendors from the US, we did have this problem uh, working, obviously, uh, with Verizon, they completely left us without service. No matter what, whether you're traveling or not, drop Verizon, do not work with them. Uh, they're absolutely the worst. But if you're going to travel, you you can't travel with Verizon. I know no one who's ever gotten a Verizon phone to work, even when they pay for the service like we did. We paid a ton to get their uh, roaming service international when we went to Europe in 2012, and they didn't actually offer it. They just charged us the money and never turned it on. And everyone I know has the same experience. They pay a bunch of money, they show up and it doesn't work. AT&T works, you pay a bunch of money and it works. T-Mobile, you don't pay anything, it just works, just free. Like, that's fantastic. If you're gonna be a traveler from the US, get that. If you're coming from Canada, you're just out of luck. I was, uh, every time I, I do anything with Canadians, and I'm international, it always blows my mind just how bad everything is coming from Canada. Their cell phones don't have service, they can't get any roaming, everything's super expensive, they have so they can't get flights. They have so many challenges that, as Americans, we're like, but. We can get all that in the US, can't they just? No, they can't, right? They're, it's really hard to do that. But we forget that Canada has all of these limitations that that we think of Canada being so similar to the US, and in many ways it is, but when you're traveling, all that falls apart. Like Canadians really have so many more uh, logistical challenges to get somewhere and to exist once they're there. But for anyone who has those kinds of challenges, you wanna get a phone here, and, and that was completely, off topic, but um, for me, the things that it, it's laptops, it's computer parts, it's camera parts, um, and that can be like, oh, I need a cage for my camera, I need a special lens. Like it's just glass, but no one sells it in country. I just did this, right? Uh, I just had a Nikon 50 millimeter f1.4 lens, just an older used lens, it's like 60 bucks, but I had it sent to my dad in New York so I could get it from him because there's no way to get that here. There's just no one has that particular lens. So very specific parts, which batteries, lenses, you know, specific hardware hard drives, memory, anything that has to match and be exactly the right part for something, or you really want a very specific model or whatever, that's the stuff you're gonna need to find a way to bring. And things like laptops are just way cheaper in the US and you get a much bigger selection. So those are things that we routinely bring back in our luggage. But as far as normal shopping, we figure out ways to do it here in Nicaragua because uh, a lot of reasons. One, you don't wanna have to go back for everything. You don't wanna have huge loads of things. A couple items here and there, no big deal. But if you're bringing back huge loads of things, that becomes a problem. Um, you wanna be able to learn to live here and not have to wait for things and you want to figure out what makes life make sense. So in some ways, the best thing to do is adapt to what you're buying, but certainly not entirely. You wanna strategically use the resources that you have to get the best value and selection and, and all that kind of stuff. So very doable, um, but there's no, there's no like handy guide to this. Everyone has different things. Literally everyone I know has completely different items that they're worried about getting when they're traveling, what they're gonna bring back in their luggage. For us, you know, it's very much camera stuff, things that, the, you know, they don't care that you're bringing in. I can bring in as many camera things as I want, but I just can't get them here, not reasonably. Uh, if you're bringing in laptops, yeah, you only get one, but you can make sure 
you're buying your laptop when you're in the US or whatever, a little bit of a little bit of management it will go a long way. Um, when you first come here, there's not going to be like a big load of things that you want to bring. Make sure if there's any specific parts, cables, you know, connectors, batteries, anything like that, make sure you have it before you come. Then you have time when you're here to learn what things you're going to want in the future, how your buying is going to change and, and that kind of stuff. Um, but I think you have a pretty good handle. You mentioned the things, right? GoPro batteries, the GoPro itself, all that stuff you need to get in the US. Getting it here, you're going to be models old, uh, high price, no warranty. It's just uh, those are things you want to avoid. Our last question. Assuming someone uses your concierge service to find out about available price, etc., about a particular property, <laughs> thanks for mentioning my concierge service. Uh, how does the gringo move forward without it turning into gringo price? Obviously, the buyer is going to want to look at the property at some point before deciding, I would think. So how does that work without revealing that you're a gringo in interested in the property? Thanks. Uh, so this is a tough one. If you want to look at a property and be there in person, you've got a problem. So if you can look at a property as best you can without showing up or out without alerting the seller that you're the one that's looking, that would be great. When I bought my first property here in Nicaragua, uh, we did so by having someone walk through with a GoPro, who we just mentioned bringing in GoPros in the last segment. But it, that's what they did. They they went and inspected it. These are people that I trusted, that I have known for a long time, personal friends, their employees, and they have construction experience. So they're a really good combination of things to have go look at a property for us, and they had a nice GoPro. So they just walked through with the GoPro, got 4K footage of absolutely everything. We were able to look at it and had a really good idea. Now, we knew the town. We had driven past outside. We knew where it was. Now, we were living outside the country at the time, so I had, wasn't like told about the property and then went and looked at it as we drove down the street. That would have been better. I didn't have that option, so this was even more remote and more difficult than, in theory, you would be dealing with. But it, let's say you just picked a house in the city and uh, you decided this is the one you might want, right? This is the hardest situation because it's right in the city. You can't really see around it. Well, you can drive by in front. You can visit houses nearby. You can look at, you can have someone go through and do tons of videos, have a local go through and take pictures and video absolutely everywhere. Um, and, and you can get to know the neighborhood. You can know what the street is like. You can see the front of it. You might be able to look in the windows. You might be able to look in the backyard. You have a whole bunch of you can get a feel for the spot under normal circumstances without actually looking at the house. But if you actually want to go inside, and obviously that's what you want to do, um, you're going to you're going to have to deal with that, right? Either you're going to have to do it sneakily, not that you should break in, but that's not at all what I mean. I just mean that if there's an opportunity somehow to get into the house uh, without it being in a I'm looking to buy situation, you know, in some cases, you know, people are living there. Maybe uh, you get invited in, right? <laughs> Whatever. Uh, but that's almost never going to be the case. You're almost never going to have an opportunity to go inside without alerting them that you're looking to buy it. So. One of the things we traditionally do here is we don't go to houses that we're looking to buy. Um, of all the properties that um, I've ever been involved with, the only time that I've ever been in them is when I was in as a consultant. Uh, I was already in. It was Gringo selling the price, selling the place. They already, you know, we had a really good idea of what the pricing was. We had years uh, into it. The ability to Gringo price us was not there, um, and I had seen the property um, without it being a I'm a buyer scenario. Scenario. So I had a lot of reasons why I was in there. I was in there all the time. I probably every few months. So I knew it inside and out. I could draw you a picture of every single thing. I knew every single thing about it. So uh, in that case, I had an opportunity to do that. But in general, every property we deal with, we do uh, at arm's length. Um, and that's just a limitation. And I know when you're looking for that perfect house, when you're looking for the, exactly the place that you want, that's a really dangerous thing to do. Uh, but what you can do is have someone go in, do a whole bunch uh, of the process, right? Go look at it a ton, take a lot of pictures, make sure you are really confident, and then get into negotiations. And then, yes, you still take some risk. You're gonna give up a little bit of power in the negotiations. But let's just say you're looking at a house in the city and you send in your representative, um, and it may just be a friend, it may be someone you hire, it could be a lawyer, it could be anything, right? But they go in, they they get a feel. Okay, well, we're I don't know if we're gonna pay 150,000 for this, but you know, would you take 105? And they say, no, no, no. But well, we'll go down to 140, and they get some amount of negotiations going. You get to a point where you're like, ah, oh, we're thinking about it. I need to go in and look at it again, and then you come in and look at it as uh, as a uh, a gringo. And at that point, yeah, they're gonna be a little bit harder on the negotiations, but you know they can't back off 
very much, right? If they came back at 140 and you said 130 and you're, you're still in that hemming and hawing phase and you come and look at it and they're like, now we're gonna be firm on 140, you can be like, I'm gonna be firm on 136, take it or leave it. And uh, you have a lot more, you know what the value is, right? You've established that to, to whatever degree you can. You're always going to be somewhat in the dark, but um, it, there, there's, there's no magic answer to this. The answer is if you want to completely avoid gringo pricing, you have to completely avoid being the gringo but you can minimize it in a lot of cases um, by, by working out that price, getting the negotiations going, doing as much as you can ahead of time. If you come in initially and you come in as the gringo and you're just, you're in there, they, from the moment they started, they're like dollar signs, right? This is, we gotta try to get two or three or 10 times the value of this property. I'm not saying 100% of the time, but almost 100%, like that's, everyone is so conditioned that a gringo represents a cash cow with no clue what they're doing. And they're often right that if you show up, once they get that mindset, they're like, oh, I'm gonna make $400,000 on this place that I thought I was only gonna make 120 on. It's hard for them to emotionally let that go because in their mind, they've already made that money. And if you don't take it, then they're thinking, well, he showed up and wanted this. Another gringo will show up and want this. I'll just hold out for the next one, even if one will never come. It's a difficult emotional position to get away from. So you don't want to establish them feeling like they're gonna get a windfall, just a fair value on the property. You can do that with, with a representative who gets in there, establishes that you're gonna negotiate hard, you're gonna get a fair value. Sure, you might overpay by a few thousand or a few percentage, that's likely. You don't have the bargaining power, no matter what, of a local who really, really knows what they're doing, but you do have ability to protect against massive uh, gringo pricing. And that, that's really what you're worried about. If you end up paying a percentage or two extra high, you pay a few thousand dollars more than a local would, honestly, that's not, the end of the world and it's great that we can help the market a little you don't want to be throwing money around and causing random windfalls that doesn't really help anybody but if you're uniformly helping to raise the market in just a small amount that does actually help everyone so uh it, it, it's a good process overall and that's that's really what you have to do um is is some amount of of willingness to keep things uh very much at arm's length and just be aware that under normal circumstances unless you're buying american built or, or canadian built homes that are really targeted at foreigners you are likely going to be buying places you're going to do a lot of work on Right, you're going to be you're going to be modifying them, updating them. It's just likely. In which case, the little tiny details, as long as the the bones of the structures are good, normally you're not too worried about the the little details that you would get by being in there because you're, you may change those anyway. So that's hopefully that answered your question. I know it's not a great answer, but it, it's realistic. All right. Thanks for thanks for watching. Like and subscribe if you'd like to help support the channel. You can buy me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash Scott Allen Miller. That really helps make this channel possible. It takes a lot of time to make this. As you know, I'm scrambling to get these out, so I'm doing my best. Thanks for joining me. Share on social media. Tell your friends about the show, and I will see all of you tomorrow. And I'll do my best to pop up on the screen some additional episodes that you can check out. Click on one of those. It tells the algorithm that you love the show.